Thank you, Ellen, Ellen, and M, and Chris for inviting me. I'm Sandra Richardson. Um, as I put in my profile, uh, I joined the health, health inclusion team about 10 years ago. And uh, my background is, of course, nursing, midwifery. I did a bit of, um, I did, uh, I worked in Lucian for about 10 years as a health visitor and worked in the liaison health visiting, as a liaison health visitor between the hospital and the generic health visiting team before joining. Uh, health inclusion team as a specialist health visitor. My presentation is going to be a bit different because I'm going to give more case scenario as in my day-to-day -day work, very different. Like a lot of people will say, what's health visiting doing there? What's your role there? <laughs> There's quite a lot to do there. Okay, I look after children from zero to 18 years up until last year when we were able to employ a pediatric nurse just to help with the over fives because it was really getting a lot of work coming in. And my day-to-day -day job is very, very different every day, very interesting. Some cases, sometimes I've, I've had to advocate for a three-year-old with sickle cell who is just coming to the country. And this child was at risk of uh, having infantile stroke. So it was always hospital admission here and there. So the consultant made a decision to do a bone marrow transplant. But because this family, they are asylum seekers, no recourse to public funds, so there was that big challenge of NHS number, who is going to fund it. So lots of emails here and there. In the end, we got there in the end, the child got the bone marrow transplant. Another example was, uh, if now the, the, the boy is about 14 now, but at the age of 10, apparently he got, he got caught in an airstrike in Syria and got bullets to his spinal cord. So the boy became quadriplegic and ended up in our asylum, uh, IA hostel, where I'm based. So lots of referrals needed to be done to Evelina Children's Centre. You have to follow up on all this referral to the continent team. You have to follow up on all of that, having case conferences. So lots of different things to do. Included in all of this is meeting the health visiting standard which is immunization of the children. Like people from Kuwait, I got to know in my job that people from Kuwait be done, I've never had healthcare. A lot of them don't have healthcare at all until, I don't know, they never get. So when you ask them, there's no immunization history, nothing. So I do a lot of catch up on all of this kind of thing. And uh, we've had women, obviously, Pregnant, we, we refer them to midwives. We work closely with midwives in my team. And like Fenella said, in my team, we've got the we've got the BBV, we've got the refugee side, and we've got the uh, the homeless side. So all of this, we work together, meet every Wednesday, and of course reflect on our practice and what we're doing and what we've been up to. So what, when these pregnant women come. A lot of them have mental health issues. I have to do the perinatal referral. I have to make sure they're seen by midwives immediately, their pregnancy booked. And uh, unfortunately, I've had two of my women in the last 10 years ended up in mother and baby units. The interesting thing is that when they go into mother and baby units, they have no family, no friends, nobody to see them. So I've had to go and visit them. And what I found in, in those visits is that when you go there, you are almost like a family has come to see them. And the feedback I get from the psychiatric nurses is that, oh, since you came, she's been complying with her medication. What did you do differently? Because obviously I've come there as a family and as a friend. So they're so happy that you've left your clinic to travel all the way. Because I've had to, because sometimes we don't get um, spaces in mother and baby unit in Beckingham, which is the closest one to us. I've had to travel all the way to Hackney to see somebody in modern baby unit. So you're almost like the only family they see around. So it's all those kind of things. And I remember when that BCG, for instance, was taken out of the hospital. It was originally given in the hospital. It was taken out of the hospital to the community. Asylum women or asylum babies or children were not considered at all. So it had to be a lot of emails between myself, my manager, to the, uh, the immunization helpline, and them not leaving this uh, cohorts, this group of children or babies out of that immunization until we got something sorted for them. So it's a lot of liaison you have to do as, an, as a health inclusion worker. You find yourself 
going out of your scope to do it. But a very beautiful thing about the team is that there's room for there's room for study days, there's room to expand your scope. Like I'm sure, I don't, I don't know if my colleague Kendra is going to share. A lot of a lot of them I've had to train, although I, I, I dropped out of that training in family planning, implants, and um, and uh, smear smear test. So a lot of a lot of us are very knowledgeable, and we've got a PGD also to cover us to give simple things like paracetamol, so we don't have to be waiting for GP and all of that. And then the big challenge we had during COVID for me. Uh, thank you to Sam for that, because I had to take that to the Homeless Health Visiting uh, Forum, was our client group getting registration with GPs. Because once they move out of the asylum, or once, they, once they get dispersed in whatever dispersal area they have, like we all knew, the GPs were not opening. So a lot of GPs were not even listening to them, let alone register them. So a lot of advocacy had to come from there, calling the GP out or or uh, bringing it to the health visiting forum <laughs> and and, and uh, some taking it out to whatever GP and saying, look, you have to register this person. 80% of our client groups don't speak English. So speaking with via language line is almost like a bread and butter for us. <laughs> so the phone lines, the, the long lines is always language line. So none of them are disadvantaged, at least to an extent, they, they, you, you, you're able to communicate the care you want to give to them. Sometimes women come, I've had a woman heavily pregnant, 38 weeks, sorry, sorry, I said I was going to share a lot of my role about with the case study. 38 weeks pregnant, was going to drop the baby anytime, and she came in a flip-flop from DRC with a six-year-old. And after talking to her about her health and everything, 30 minutes on, she said to me, I didn't listen to anything you had to say because I've been in this close for 14 days, going through the jungle. So I'm not listening to what you, and I thought to myself, oh, I should have asked about that. But sometimes in the clinic, you don't even have the capacity to ask about their journey and where they're coming from. So it's better where I stopped and I took her to the room where we had our little collection of uh, socks, uh, sandal or whatever, just to make her comfortable. So everything to had a bath and then stole that I'll see her the next day. So things like that. And of course, sending her off to go and look after her personal hygiene and get food for her six-year-old, you have to quickly do a midwifery referral because you could come back the next day and baby's popped out. So it's all those kind of things we, we, we meet on a daily basis. The interesting bit of the work is that no two days are the same. No two days are the same you see different things different ways that you have to help so it's almost like holistic help all the holi holistic um care all the time that you're giving i've had a nine-year-old with cancer come from i can't remember the country now and immediately i made a hospital referrer but i was very upset about that because next day dad was asked to come to hospital and there was nobody to book transport for him so he had to walk and I'm talking from, I don't know how many miles that would be, from uh, uh, East Dulwich to King's College Hospital. That's about a good 30 minutes walk. He had to carry this boy on his back. That got me really upset. And I think I, I, I made a complaint to Home Office about that. So those kind of advocacy you have to be doing on a daily basis to make sure that um, other appointments, transport was booked, taxi was booked for him and all of that. So a lot of uh, interesting bit of work to do in homeless health. So the, the list is, it's inexhaustible. So thank you. I think that's a bit, that's about all I've got to say. We work closely with a lot of the MDTs, perinatal team, midwives, uh, Evelina, Heli help, any help they're always on hand because a lot of the women, for instance, suffer PTSD, but early help really, really supports us in our work. Although they are another organization outside of us, but they refer, I do a lot of referrals to them all the time. And lots of charities that get pushed here because they have no finance, no money, nothing. But of course, they would be low in mood all the time. So it's all of this, keeping an eye on all of these and making sure that they are, they're looking after themselves. That it, it, it's interesting and I'd, I'd encourage students to come into it because you'll really learn a lot in inclusion health. Uh, thank you. I think that's about it for me.